Hello and welcome back everyone. Laudator Jesus Christus. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News. I'm coming to you today on November 13th, 2019 with my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, the Editor-in-Chief of Catholic Family News. Hello, Brian. Hello, Matt. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well, and a happy feast of St. Lucy today, another one of the early Roman martyrs who's mentioned in the canon of the Mass. And as I understand, she was a, a young person, you might say, maybe a, what we would now call a, a teenager at the time of her martyrdom, uh, a Roman martyr, and a ver I believe she was a martyr to preserve her virginity intact. One of the, uh, That was a common theme for the female martyrs in the early church so we give thanks to god for the witness of her life and it's it's been a, a good week of feast days of course on this past sunday we had the the solemn feast of our lady's immaculate conception yesterday um we don't have this feast on the, tr the traditional calendar hopefully someday when sanity is restored and we can have a single calendar again it will be added the feast of our lady of guadalupe was the anniversary of her final apparition to Juan Diego in the year 1531. I think folks can probably see behind me the banner of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So uh, I wanted to just briefly mention St. Lucy because it's kind of a stark contrast uh, between the witness of her life and her willingness to die for the faith even as a young person uh, versus our some related to our first story today. Um, the big news that was announced actually on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which December 8th, of course, uh, Pope Francis made a kind of a surprising announcement concerning a Cardinal Luis Tagle, who is from, I believe he's from Manila in the Philippines. Philippines. Yes, Philippines. he's the, Ar the Archbishop of Manila which I believe is the, the largest archdiocese in that area of the world. So I've got a CNA Catholic News Agency report from December 8th. The headline says, Cardinal Tagle named head of Vatican Evangelization Office. So it reads, Pope Francis Sunday appointed Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle, Archbishop of Manila, Philippines, to lead the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. And as the article goes on to explain, that that office used to be called years ago, for many centuries actually, the, the prop, Propagation for the Faith, Propaganda Fidei. So Tagle, according to this article, is only 62 years old, and he follows Cardinal Fernando Filoni as prefect, usually referred to by its historic name of Propaganda Fidei. Charged with the church's missionary works and territories, Propaganda Fide is one of the largest curial departments with a size and scope exceeding almost any other. So it's the connection with um, that I had come to mind regarding St. Lucy. Cardinal Tagle was a one of the major players in last year's Synod on the Youth. And as you remember, I, I was over there to cover that for CFN and also for the Fatima Center. And I remember reporting over there that, you know, they should have been taking that opportunity, having a synod on the youth to focus on the lives of the, the early martyrs, many of whom were young people, and kind of infuse into that event the spirit of the martyrs and a willingness to, uh, you know, have that such that deep love for our Lord and the church that you're willing to give your life. Where And then the stark contrast is seeing... Uh, Card none other than Cardinal Tagle making this uh, brief like promo music video where he's you know dancing and beat and snapping his fingers with the young people saying is this okay can we do it this way la 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 you know like and it's fine to I mean obviously it's fine to to have fun with the young people and such but I mean it, the video certainly doesn't strike me as something that's becoming for a prince of the church. And what's even more concerning about uh, this whole situation of him being appointed to the position that he has is, uh, according to rumblings in Rome and around the world, he is actually uh, 
I think one article I was reading commentary that he's actually known as the Bergoglio of Asia and that he is a very yeah. possible successor to Francis. I don't know if you've been hearing similar things on your end. Yeah, he's they've they've been saying that about him for a long time, even going back to the youth synod. There were stories about that. Um, and, and it's been interesting. There have been some rumor mill rumblings from Rome that Francis believes his pontificate is coming to an end sometime soon. Maybe right. that's wishful on people's parts. <laughs> I don't know. But, but but it does appear he is at least, again, this could be years in advance, but preparing by putting people in key places to uh, try to help them along in succession. Correct. And then uh, another report regarding the story that I was reading that gives some some helpful background information and kind of stresses the significance of this appointment, because as, as the saying goes, personnel is policy. Um, Edward Penton, our friend and colleague at the National Catholic Register, in his report on this news, uh, mentions so that for the past six years or so, as viewers may recall, uh, shortly after Francis was elected pope, he established a council of cardinals to help advise him on how to reform the Roman Curia, because that was the the pretext, you might say, for his election, that he, you know, he was going to come in and be this great reformer of the Roman Curia, and obviously that hasn't happened. <laughs> um, but they they have been for so for the past six years they've been working on this new what will eventually supposedly be an apostolic constitution, which is a, a an ecclesiastical legal document, uh, and the the working title for this document because it's been a draft was released earlier this year I believe in May Edward says in his report, it's called. Uh, Predicate Evangelium, preach the gospel, and Edward explains, according to the draft text that first appeared in May, the newly reformed Roman Curia is expected to place a premium on evangelization, so it says, whatever that word even means, means to them, <laughs> possibly turning propaganda fide, which is what Cardinal Tagle is now in charge of, and the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization, merging those two offices into what uh, Edward Penton dubs a super dicastery, which would be second only to the Vatican Secretariat of State. So it would actually be above the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is... Well, that fits with the new evangelization. <laughs> faith comes after getting along. Right, <laughs> exactly. And it, I mean... We never really, when when modern churchmen use the word evangelization, we really don't know what, what they mean by that anymore, because clearly the vast majority of them no longer mean converting souls to the one true church, to the one true faith. So it's it's anybody's guess what they mean by evangelization. I, I go into that a little bit in my new report, um, giving analysis and commentary on these Amazon Synod final document, which is available on our website, catholicfamilynews.com. So this news that Cardinal Tagle has been appointed to a, a, a pretty significant office of the Roman Curia, and people are speculating that it's so that essentially he can get his feet wet in Rome. So he will, you know, with this appointment, his see in Manila will be vacant and he'll have to have a successor there because he'll be devoted full time to this work in the Roman Curia. So this is definitely, as I've, I've heard folks say, definitely a story we'll want to keep our eyes on because it's a pretty significant appointment. And, and as I mentioned, the old saying, uh, personnel is policy. So, mm -hmm. so exactly. we, oh, one other thing I was going to mention um, before we move on to our next story. So earlier this year, actually, it was on May 12th which was, is, or not May, I'm sorry, March 12th, the day before uh, the anniversary of Pope Francis's election. He was elected on March 13th, 2013. So on March 12th of this year, uh, Vaticanista Antonio Sochi, who is probably familiar to some of our viewers for his book, The Fourth Secret of Fatima, where he reveals that he actually investigated the claims of the so-called Fatimists, uh, initially being skeptical of them, but actually was, after um, studying the evidence, became convinced that there is a missing text of the secret. 
So on March 12th of this year, Antonio Sochi actually tweeted that from what he hears in Rome, two potential front runners for the next conclave are Cardinal Pietro Parolin, who's the current Secretary of State, and he's actually the mastermind supposedly behind the Rome's capitulation to China. He's the one who really uh, brokered that that deal, if you can call it that. Um, it fell out. Yeah, exactly. And then so Cardinal Parolin and then Cardinal Luis Tagle. So we'll have to continue following this story and, and see how it plays out. Yes. So um, moving on to our next story. Or yes, yes. So for this, we, we uh, go over the Alps to Germany. And as we've reported previously, uh, the German bishops uh, have set off on what they call a synodal path, which is sort of like <laughs> a really interesting development of this synod that Francis has. At least he has them and they're over. They're talking about this like permanent synodal path that they'll be on. So they're going to be lost in the woods, I don't know, in the Ardennes somewhere on this synodal path. Um, but, you know, just as uh, our, our you know, we celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception this week and Our Lady was preserved from original sin from the moment of conception, this whole synodal path has been conceived with actual sin from its, you know, its conception. Um, you know, we reported on the, the, the horrible uh, uh, things about its, its beginning previously. But now, uh, in anticipation of its beginning, the German Bishops Conference released a uh, study, a consultation that they've been conducting to prepare for more synodal path. Um, and it, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's um, uh, entitled Discuss it, uh, uh, The Sexuality of Man, uh, Discussing It Scientifically hyphen Theologically, whatever mm. that means and assessing it ecclesiastically. And this consultation involved uh, theologians, it said, canon lawyers, and I love this, sexologists. Oh, what right. <laughs> I don't know what Brings they Brings to mind somebody about. like Kinsey or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was thinking of, uh, uh, what's his name, West and Theology of the Body. Maybe that's oh, what people are. Oh, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But uh, nothing good could come from this, it sounds like. And exactly that's what happened. They re released a press release just before the uh, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, a few days before, uh, declaring that uh, homosexuality is normal, that having a predisposition to, ho to homosexuality was a normal, that um, human well, that sexuality... Goes right, that goes right along with something that uh, Father James Martin tweeted out. It was either earlier this week or last week. He was citing a study published in the New York Times or something about that chimpanzees or apes or something exhibit same-sex behavior. So the implication is that, well, it's okay for us then. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And so they went on to say that human sexuality expressed itself in a plurality. Quote, there was also agreement that the sexual preference of man expresses itself uh, in puberty and assumes either a hetero or homosexual orientation. Both belong to the normal forms of sexual predisposition. <laughs> so uh, this is this is just a 180 degree contradiction with the church. They then, in a very modernist fashion, go on to say, "Oh, but we haven't yet decided whether practicing homosexuality is still wrong or not. We're still thinking about that." <laughs> well, obviously, when you say something is normal, right? That's how nature works. If you have a normal desire, then it's there's there's nothing wrong with with that desire if it's normal. If it's as the even the modern John Paul II Catechism says, if it is rather a disorientation, which is what the Catechism of John Paul II itself calls homosexual tendencies as disor a disorientation, unnatural. intrinsically disordered, yes. intrinsically, then it's it's not good you can like there's no question there's no debate but again this is how they do it they make this broad statement and then try to calm people down by saying oh oh but but we're, we haven't yet said whether you can practice this or not um they then go on to uh they said they didn't have complete agreement but several prelates agreed that uh a sexual relationship after a divorce with a person not the spouse <laughs> after the divorce <laughs> uh is no longer a grave sin after wait for it a morris Letizia. Yeah. So just proclaiming now, not only can you just go to communion, but it's not even a grave sin. Um, so I guess adultery is now a venial sin. That's what they're what they're Unbelievable. saying. Unbelievable. Um, again, what they point to is they say we can make these changes because of the development of doctrine as evidenced by Morris Letizia and uh, that this 
teaching on homosexuality is, quote, implicit in Morris Letizia. <laughs> so it, it just shows that, you know, as radical as Francis is, it's, it's actually only the beginning of the of the next development. Right. He has the seeds right. of the stage already already. Well, and, and as you as we brought up during our last show, you know, uh, based on his comments to the Jesuits when he was in uh, Japan, Thailand, Japan, referring to equating Amoris Laetitia chapter eight with the magisterium of the church. Yes. Like, so it's just amazing. It's and it ultimately it goes back to the uh, to Benedict the Sixteenth's notion of this hermeneutic of continuity that you can yeah. just wave a magic verbal wand and and assert continuity without actually having to demonstrate it and just poof that it's in continuity yeah there, there's, i mean we could do a whole show on this but there's a, a really good article years ago by father glaze on this idea of living tradition right. and what it is what benedict's understanding is is that the continuity of tradition is not because we're handing on the same things again tradition means to hand on so you have something, you give it to me, I hand the same thing on. But the continuity, according to Benedict, was always the subject is the same. So it's the church has yeah. this doctrine that the church teaches, and the church is the same being, and that's the continuity, even if the message changes. So rather than the continuity being, you say one thing to me, I repeat the exact same thing being continuity, it's the church is the same being, even if the church is saying different things over time. I mean, that's just right. and that's. A- Definitely at the root, I would say, of the crisis in the church is, and I want to, I definitely want to go more into this in the paper. Uh, Professor Roberto De Matei has actually written a book uh, that was published this year. I've been meaning to interview him about that. I'm hoping to do that sometime soon. It's called Apologia for Tradition. It was published, uh, it was actually released originally in Italian in 2011, but Angelus Press has published an English translation earlier this year. It's and that's what... That's what exactly. he focuses on is the the difference between the objective content of tradition, the word of God, that is what holds primacy. The the living tradition or the living magisterium, the subjects who hand it on are secondary and they are subject to the objective content. And that has to be understood because that's this notion of the living magisterium taking primacy is where we get papalatry essentially yeah and and the living magisterium is no longer subject to the word of god and that's a very serious problem for obvious reasons that's where we that's how we end up with something like a morris letizia that that well that's authentic development of doctrine no it's not it's not handing on what he has received from the church yes well, and again, I guess to close out this story, I just remind uh, our, our great predecessor and colleague, John Venari, had uh, done a lot of done some reporting years ago in the paper on understanding the situation in the German church and why the German bishops are so eager to appease the modern, you know, the atheists and, and hedonists of the modern world. Because in Germany, the government collects a church tax and oh, they yes. pay this church tax over to any religion based on the number of people who fill out their tax form saying I'm of this religion. And so what was happening is in Germany, they were losing all this money because the young people were checking out and yeah. falling away from the church. So their idea has been, well, if we become hip and start mm. embracing homosexuality and cohabitation, which all these young German fallen away Catholics are doing, then maybe they won't get upset with us. It'll check the box and we'll get their tax. And uh, that, John did a lot of reporting on this years ago that that is really what explains, I mean, it explains in a, it just doesn't justify, obviously, but explains the motivations of the German bishops to just come go even further than radical liberals like Francis are willing to do uh, to, to try to appease, which they never do because they're, they find the church irrelevant, but try to right. appease these younger generations of cohabiting homosexual you know, German youth to get them to just check the box and keep their money. <laughs> and this, yeah. as you just mentioned, the saddest part is that it's it's doomed to failure because when the church accommodates the world, it becomes irrelevant. Yes. And that what, you know, as we've seen with the Society of St. Pius X and other traditionalist societies and orders, tradition is what is attracting the young people, not uh, not mimicking or aping the world. Yes. So it's very sad that they can't get that through their heads, apparently. It is. 
So for folks who want to read more about this story, LifeSite News has published a report earlier this week. Uh, the headline is German bishops proclaim homosexuality, quote, normal, adultery, quote, not grave. That was published on December 9th. Yes. All right. So we have some more uh, Vatican related news to go back to, to Rome now. There's a... Um, I was going to say famous, but I probably should say infamous uh, archbishop who's a Vatican official. His name is Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia. He was a diocesan bishop in Italy. Uh, I forget for how many years, but then let me see. I think around 2012 it was that he was a, got his first uh, Roman appointment. So towards the end of Benedict the 16th's reign. And then under Pope Francis is when he's really become this high-profile uh, figure. He is currently the president of the Pontifical Academy for Life and chancellor of the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family Sciences, both of them based in Rome. And both of those bodies have been radically reorganized and some would say, uh, many would argue, demolished uh, under Francis. Their original intent has really been destroyed um, I'm not sure if we've covered any of this in our in previous broadcasts, but the Pontifical Academy for Life and the John Paul II Institute have undergone radical changes uh, under the pontificate of Francis and really undermining their original purposes. I know LifeSite News in particular has done a lot of reporting in that regard, that the original, you know, the at least in, in realms of moral theology, the Orthodox faculty have been more or less elbowed out and and there are new very heterodox radical faculty members yeah. and archbishop paglia is at the center of all this as the leader of those two bodies so i i came across a report on social media earlier this week and it's from crux we don't usually cite them as a source but this uh certainly caught my attention for two reasons, which I'll get into. So the, the headline from Crux says, and this was published on December 10th, Vatican official, uh, colon, I'd quote, hold hand of person dying from assisted suicide. And that's a quote from Archbishop Paglia. He was uh, speaking, so there was a there was some sort of a, an event held in Rome. Let me pull up the press conference briefing real quick here. So let's see. Earlier this week, there was an international symposium of religion and medical ethics, palliative care and the mental health of the elderly. And it was an event organized by the Pontifical Academy for Life, the body that he heads, as well as the World Innovation Summit for Health, what the acronym WISH, an initiative of the Qatar Foundation. And it was held at the Augustinium in Rome, so a prestigious school in Rome, a university. So earlier this week, uh, December 10th, there was a press conference the day before to kind of introduce the symposium and give the leadership and a chance to summarize what was going to take place. And then, you know, at, generally at these press conferences after the, the um, interventions or the pre you know, pre-recorded remarks are given, or pre-prepared remarks, then they open it up to questions and answers. So I believe it was during the question and answer session with journalists that Archbishop Paglia made these controversial statements about, I'm going to find, here's a quote uh, from Archbishop Paglia. So he said during this question and answer session, quote, I believe that from our perspective, no one is abandoned, even if we are against assisted suicide, because we don't want to do death's dirty job, the archbishop said. To accompany, to hold the hand of someone who is dying is something that every faithful must promote, as they must promote a culture that opposes assisted suicide. I mean, so, it's like <laughs> We're opposed to murder, but I want to hold the murderer's hand while he shoots somebody. I mean, that's what you're doing. <laughs> right, exactly. And I, this is just basic fun, like basic principles of morality. There are nine ways of participating in the sin of another. Uh, it, it's amazing to me that a Vatican official, a prelate of the church, does not understand that basic principle. Mm. So 
that's the one thing that he's, you know, that's the headline that grabbed initially grabbed my attention, but uh, even more astounding in, in some ways. So in the context of assisted suicide, for some reason, Judas Iscariot came to his mind. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he here's what he had to say about uh, about Judas. Let's I see guess here. he had Dr. Kevorkian help him back. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Oh my goodness! All right, so this is so this article by Crux or on Crux was written by uh, Ines San Martin, who's the Rome bureau chief for Crux, and she explains in her article. Uh, Paglia noted that the church says there's no certainty that even the apostle Judas, who betrayed Jesus before killing himself, is in hell, and no. she and she quotes. Uh, Archbishop Paglia is saying for a Catholic to say so, in other words, to affirm that Judas is in hell, he says it's heresy. <laughs> it, the irony of, of a, the irony of a man like him, who, by the way, viewers uh, I'm sure would have heard about this, that I think back in 2007 when he was still a diocesan bishop. I, we won't show the image because it's just too disgusting and, and graphic, but he ag actually had commissioned for his cathedral church, he commissioned a, an openly homosexual artist to paint a very large-scale mural that is a, it's our Lord holding up two nets, one on each side, and the nets are full. It's a like a homoerotic scene. It's disgusting. It, it's pornographic. And he put himself, this bishop, in the homoerotic. He had himself painted into it. Correct. Uh, and because and John, the, this paper, Catholic Family News, covered this back when it came out. Yes. Uh, this scandal that erupted over it. And eventually they kind of had to paint over part of it. It was so pornographic. Yeah, and I, yeah, it's, it's disgusting. There's no other way to describe it. Um, and the artist who painted it, I was just reading up on a, a report from a couple years ago from LifeSite about the details of this this mural. And the artist uh, was interviewed about it and said, you know, every that I never, this is not just my project. Like I was getting direction from superiors, the ones who ordered, ones who commissioned it, you know, a few times a week. So they they knew they approved every step of the way. So we know that Archbishop Paglia approved of that abomination in his cathedral yes um so for a man like that to be to be uh calling out others on heresy just on anything is kind of laughable but specifically on this issue because the church um, it's not it hasn't been defined de fide like a dogma of the faith but it's a common teaching of the church and it's just kind of a matter of common sense if you really if you think about it that judas showed no signs of repentance. I'm just going to read, I have my copy of the, the Roman Catechism here, and this is what I've been emphasizing on social media, is that the Roman Catechism teaches in at least two spots that I that I know of that Judas did lose his soul. So there's one instance uh, in the teaching on the sacrament of penance, where it says it's concerning, you know, true versus false penitence, True being, you know, that you're truly sorry for having offended God and want to amend and that sort of thing. But then there's also just the this quote unquote repentance of having done something evil and kind of falling into despair. So this is what it says concerning this, the latter and, and Judas. It says others, on the contrary, give themselves to such melancholy and grief as utterly to abandon all hope of salvation such perhaps was the condition of Cain when he uh, when he exclaimed, "My iniquity is greater than I may deserve pardon." And the catechism goes on, such certainly, certainly was the condition of Judas, who, you know, quote unquote, repenting, hanged himself and thus lost soul and body. So that's pretty clear teaching on concerning the fate of Judas. And then there's also another reference to Judas under the, the teaching on the sacrament of holy orders and the right intention needed to receive that sacrament. And it mentions some are attracted to the priesthood by ambition and love of honors, while there are others who desire to be ordained simply in order that they may abound in riches. We know that we know from Scripture, from the Gospels, that Judas was an avaricious, a greedy man. 
And so it goes down. Uh, such people derive no other fruit from their priesthood than was derived by Judas the, uh, from the apostleship, which only brought him everlasting destruction. Mm-hmm. So the, cat, the Roman Catechism makes it very clear concerning the fate of Judas and also emphasizes uh, the serious, you know, that suicide is an objective violation of the fifth commandment. I know John actually... I remember him writing about this shortly before he passed, and he was, you know, I'm sure he went through a fair amount of suffering, but he, even in those last months, he was still, you know, zealously emphasizing no one has the right to take their own life. It's a violation of the fifth commandment. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, with all due respect, His Excellency needs to brush up on some basic catechism and... (laughs) Yeah. Yes. And stop, stop spouting these horrible things that are just, it's confirming people in a very grave sin and, and is very potentially leading souls to hell. It's very serious. Yes. Well, uh, in terms of serious things, our, our, um, another story which was reported on uh, yesterday, December 12th, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, is that an open letter, another open letter to the Pope was released. Uh, specifically on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, It's signed by 90 individuals, families, and couples. uh, From It looks like primarily from the United States and France. I have to admit, I I don't recognize many of the names on that. I don't know who they are, but many of them give locations. So they seem to be either in France or the United States. Um, The press release looks like it came out in France, in Paris. But this open letter, once again, calls upon Pope Francis to stop worshiping uh, Pacamama, Mother Earth, and to return to the veneration of the Blessed Mother. So it calls upon specifically uh, the Holy Father to return to the veneration of Our Lady and to stop this veneration of Mother Earth. Uh, it, it opens with, uh, as again, that's why I say, I think it was released this day, with a quotation from Our Lady of Guadalupe. She says, and they begin the letter, I am here, I who am your mother. Right? And it's yes. like they... These, these 90 people are reminding the Pope, Mother Earth is not our mother. The Blessed Virgin Mary is our mother. Yes. Um, and again, interestingly, I, I don't recognize these names. I don't know if you looked at them. So this is not coming from the sort of other sources that the prior open letters and appeals to bishops have come from. These appear to be, you know, a different quarter of the church uh, expressing the same sentiment. Yes, and I think that was kind of the... the um impetus of the initiative was to be not that it not to be another um, scholarly initiative but just the you know as bishop athanasius schneider often refers to the the little ones in the church mm-hmm. those who don't have a particular standing other than being baptized faithful catholics so this was a an opportunity for for the the average catholic you might say to add their name to a letter that's been sent to the pope just pleading with him as we would with a with a father who's making very bad choices and doing things that are essentially abusive to his children to his family to to stop you know yes and actually bishop snyder has i read uh, endorsed this initiative wholeheartedly and commended it um and you know given it his support yes uh, so interestingly though uh, so again this story you could life site news has a copy of the full copy of the letter on a report yesterday uh, you can find it other places, but they have a, a, a copy of it there. Um, but interestingly, at, at the same time, another story broke also on Crux that, um, that, although, again, we don't usually cite them, but I, that's the only place I've seen it. Uh, quoting from a uh, sermon of Pope Francis on the Feast of Our Gua- uh, Lady of Guadalupe, uh, which was really quite disturbing. And, and uh, so he, the, this, the theology of the sermon is really confusing, but the most disturbing point is uh, he's, he's been asked about proclaiming uh, dogma of Our Lady as co-redemptrix. And this is something that goes back uh, many, many decades. And in fact, the, the conservative traditional fathers at the council were pushing very hard for this at the Second Vatican Council, to have something good come out of the council. Right. They actually they have this dogma which has been around, uh, again, in a common belief, in an unofficial way throughout the church, but to formalize it and actually proclaim it as an, you know, an official dogma, right. uh, Our Lady is co-redemptrix, that she so united herself with the sufferings of Christ uh, that she 
uh, you know, that she is co- uh, co-redemptrix and it also mediatrix of all grace they wanted to attach to it. Yes. Uh, Paul VI got pressure from the liberals. This wouldn't be a, the Protestants wouldn't like this. So he backed off and as a compromise. Proclaimed, proclaimed Our Lady Mother of the Church, which, I mean, what you know, fine, it's a very good title, but it was sort of seen as well as less offensive. Um, but in any event, he's asked about this, and and he he indicated he would certainly not be part of this. Now, to be fair, both Benedict and John Paul II shied away from this, but the language he used again is, is shocking. He called it declaring uh, Our Lady co-redemptress is just foolishness. So again, this is the way he operates, rather than. You know, engaging a theological or, or a discussion or a point, he just dismisses anybody that opposes him with uh, ad hominem attacks. He just says, right. oh, I mean, it's oh, essentially it's the cool. same. I think it's essentially the same thing that Archbishop Paglia did. That and and it's, I I hope for their sake that they're doing it out of ignorance because, um, I mean, this is very. That's like you're calling down wrath when you're. I mean, that, I take this as a direct insult to Our Lady and her her motherhood over over mankind um and i just wanted to read a quote that i found um when i was doing a little research on this subject i actually have a i have a book on the subject that i bought years ago it's by a a um doctor of theology and his specialty is mariology it's called with jesus i don't know if folks can see that the the story of uh, the story of Mary co-redemptrix, and it really goes through the history, starting with the early fathers, St. Irenaeus, for example, who talked, you know, the, the theology of Mary as co-redemptrix is rooted in her identity as the new Eve, and that she is so yeah. closely associated with our Lord, the new Adam, that she did take a real, she did participate in a real way, subordinate to him, but in a very real way, just as Eve you know, played a real part in original sin and the fall of man. So also our Our Lady, the Immaculate Virgin uh, without sin, played a real role in the redemption of mankind. That's That's been the common teaching of the church for centuries. And that's what this book, Dr. Miravalle, outlines, you know, starting with the early church fathers, then going through the scholastic theologians. Um, you can very clearly demonstrate continuity in doctrine mm-hmm. with this one. So to claim that it's foolishness, I mean, you're calling a whole litany of saints and doctors of the church fools. Yes. I mean, the, the, the hubris, the audacity to make such a statement is almost beyond comprehension how he could say something like that. Yeah. Not to mention, I mean, on a feast of Our Lady, no less. It's just unbelievable. Well, and that's the, again, it's really, it's, it's a long uh, excerpt from the sermon, but to get into what he says again is really troubling because again, first he dismisses all these current Catholics and and as you say, doctors of the church and saints as foolish, but then he goes on to basically say, well, Our Lady actually has no titles. He, he says all these titles we've made up, and there he sort of says they're insulting to her that <laughs> her only title is Mother and Mestizos. I forget how you pronounce it in Spanish. Um, oh, uh, mest- uh, Mestizo or something. Mestizos, yeah. And he goes, all the other titles she doesn't like, and and uh, she doesn't want these. And so, again, this idea of Our Lady, she thinks that any titles to her take away from her son, which is the most bizarre theology, because Our Lady is the model of true humility, and true humility is truth, right? Be, sure. To be humble is to be true. Again, humility isn't self-deprecation, right? Beating yourself up. It is being true about who you are. And and that means, you know, recognizing that God is is so far superior to us, but also truly recognizing what gifts he's given to us. Right. It's not saying so if God has really given you a gift, Our Lady, it's not like if we say to her, oh, we, oh, you're conceived without original sin. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, no, no. I'm being humble. That's a false idea of humility. Right. It's to recognize, yes, I have this incredible gift, the only one in the human race given to but to attribute it to God, right? It's pride Correct. is when you attribute it to yourself. Oh, this is mine. I deserved it. But it's not to deny the reality of what you are. And again, Francis says she doesn't want any of these titles. Well, he obviously doesn't know very much about any apparitions because when she appeared at our uh, uh, to our uh, St. Bernadette and Lords, when she kept being uh, St. Bernadette for every apparition said, please tell me your name. Please tell me your name. When she finally tells her name, she says, I am the Immaculate Conception. She uses right. the title. At Fatima, when the children, again, keep asking, who are you? In October, she says, I am the Lady of the Rosary. 
Yes. So contrary to Francis, Our Lady herself has used titles referring to her and referring to aspects of her honor uh, when she appears to us. But Absolutely. knows better that she, you know, and that it's again just appalling about this report. So again, in contrast to this open letter calling about Francis to give true devotion to Our Lady, at the exact same day he's in Rome, really insulting Our Lady and calling her defenders throughout history fools. Uh, and that's really kind of an interesting contrast. To the Which includes life. his very, you know, relatively recent predecessors, uh, actually yeah. including John Paul II, who used the term, and that's that's he's quoted in this book that I have, yeah. using the term co-redemptrix and also mediatrix of all graces. He used that term, I think, a total of seven times or something in public yeah. statements. Again, but, both of them are contradictory. They supported it privately, but then were opposed to proclaiming it as a dogma because they thought it would offend the Orthodox and some other people. Right. So they were very contradictory. I mean, but they the pre- certainly were. The, yeah. the preconciliar popes, I know uh, that oh. this book goes into like Pope Leo the Thirteenth, for example, and also uh, Pope St. Pius the Tenth, um, Pius the Eleventh, Pius, or, yeah. excuse me, Benedict the Fifteenth. And I want to read a quote from him in just a moment. But all the preconciliar popes, you know, are in lockstep on this doctrine. It just hasn't yet been uh, solemnly defined as a dogma of the faith. But this, for example, this is what Benedict the, the excuse me, the 15th, so the Pope during the First World War, this is what he taught about this uh, issue of co-redemptrix in a 1918 apostolic letter. He wrote concerning Our Lady, she gave up her mater- her mother excuse me, she gave up her mother's rights over her son to procure the salvation of mankind and to appease the divine justice, she, as much as she could, immolated her son so that one can truly affirm that together with Christ, she has redeemed the human race, end quote. Mm -hmm. And And that's the essence of it right there, that she freely cooperated in a singular manner in offering our Lord to the Father and all of her, you know, her sufferings in that martyrdom are unimaginable to us. The saints talk about it being worse than all the pains of all the martyrs of all time put together. The sufferings of her maternal heart, seeing our Lord not only as her own flesh and blood, but as as a divine person, God in, in the flesh, uh, being so mocked and mistreated and Our Lady witnessing that, it was a martyrdom beyond our comprehension. Yeah. So... So for our part at Catholic Family News, we certainly hold to the traditional teaching that Our Lady absolutely is co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces and the universal advocate for all mankind. And you're absolutely right. It's rooted in the theology of Our Lady as the new Eve, right? And again, all the parallels are there. So our, um, in, in, in the new setting, so at Eve comes from the rib of Adam, right? And in but in Our Lady, Our Lord takes his material element from the body of Our Lady. Right? Our Lord's body is formed solely from the body of Our, our Lady. But then also, it was our, our Lord is the new, the new Adam. And um, in, in Original Sin, Eve takes the fruit from the serpent. But Original Sin, so she participates in, she is a, a participant, a co-sinner with Adam. But the, the Original Sin doesn't fall to the human race until Adam takes the, takes the sin, right? So the Again, the theologians, the the fathers and doctors of the church always taught if Adam had refused the fruit offered by Eve, Eve would have sinned, but the human race would not have. And so she participates fully, but the act is actually completed by Adam. So the same thing with Our Lady. Our Lord is the one who completes the redemption, but she, just as Eve vitally participated in the original sin, Our Lady participates in the redemption. It participates in the sense, though, that it is not complete for the human race until our Lord completes it. So again, the theology lines up beautifully, yes, uh, not, not foolishly. Right, right. So uh, as always, I, I think we're about wrapped up with yep. this week's show, and we'll end as we usually do with uh, praying the Hail Mary and certainly asking for Our Lady's intercession for the for Pope Francis and the bishops of the Church um, that they that this diabolical disorientation, as Sister Lucia Fatima put it, would uh, be lifted sooner rather than later, and that the church can return to sanity and 
I believe one day, as I imagine you do, that uh, you know, when, when we have a truly holy pope again, that this will be defined as a dogma of the faith, and it could very well be part of the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. Perhaps, yes. So we will see what happens. But uh, until next time, we, we thank you all for joining us. And, and please remember uh, to support our apostolate by subscribing or renewing your subscription to our, our newspaper. You can do that by visiting our website, which is www.catholicfamilynews.com. And we thank you so much for your support. Please remember to, to like and share this video on social media to help us spread the word and gain more uh, subscribers on our YouTube channel so that we can continue to grow the apostolate and uh, continue fighting the good fight of faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady Co-Redemptrix, pray, pray for us. Saint Lucy, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, thank you again for another show, Brian. We'll see you next time, and God bless, and Our Lady protect you all.